So far, we've been looking at spatial and temporal vision separately. Now, motion perception requires combination of both domains and we detect motion when there's a change in the position of luminance pattern over time. So it is known that we are very sensitive to motion, yet the smallest detectable shift, so in other words, motion detection threshold is about 10 arc seconds. Motion perception is usually decomposed into the space and time for analysis. For example, if we just um, you know, watch a car passing by from left to right, then we can illustrate this observation as still images in space-time diagram like this. And here the car's position is plotted on the horizontal axis as a function of a time on the vertical axis with displacement in time, which is um, basically velocity in the unit of degrees of visual angle per second. So how does our visual system compute motion? About 50 years ago, a very simple circuit model was suggested by a German physicist named Werner Reichardt. So this Reichardt model, um, now it's known as a Reichardt detector, requires two spatially separated inputs um, depicted as point 0.1 and point 0.2 here, and temporal filters to delay the delivery of signal triggered by the input to create a time difference and a comparator. So um, the comparator is this box um, uh, with the, uh, the big cross that can evaluate the spatial and temporal changes signaled by these inputs. So according to this model, motion and its direction can be signaled when two spatially separated inputs from adjacent retinal locations are initiated at slightly different times. So when the original signal from one point in space coincides with the delayed signal from an adjacent point in space will signal the motion and its respective direction. So here is a cartoon illustration how the Rikar detector signals the direction of a moving object. So in this case, and the visual object, which is this car, uh, is moving from left to right. Um, the detector on the left is triggered and will send a copy of that signal to the neighboring detectors too. So when the object reaches the uh, next detector, then the signal is sent to the original detector is combined with the signal triggered by the neighboring detector and will signal the motion. So our motion perception provides lots of helpful functions for our survival, and that is part of the reason why mammals, including humans, have exquisite sensitivity to motion. For example, simply detecting that something is moving in our surrounding draws our immediate attention to it. So this is the reason why some animals freeze when they sense danger or predators around because an object uh, moving against the static background will be easily segregated and spotted. In addition, uh, motion information can help to reconstruct uh, a 3D information of an object. We can also compute the distance to various objects in the scene to avoid collision and estimate the direction where we're heading within the scene. And finally, we also um, uh, we can also recognize actions of humans or other living organisms with a very limited amount of motion information. So many animals use colors and patterns on their bodies 
to help them blend into the background and avoid the attention of predators, which is called crypsis in zoology, defined as the strategies animals use to avoid detection by other animals. So camouflage is one of the well-known methods of crypsis many animals are evolved with, like the one in this picture. So we don't, many times we don't even know where to look at um, and, you know, what to look for. Um, so they are cunningly effective as long as they don't move. But once they move, um, then camouflage is broken and it becomes much easier to recognize them because their deceptive presence is now segregated from the background by motion. Motion also provides information about depth and other three-dimensional information about an object. So this is an example of what is called kinetic depth effect, where you can perceive a three-dimensional structure of an object when the object is set in motion. It is a basically time-lapse video of the daily pictures of the moon taken over a month, uh, demonstrating liberation of the moon, uh, which is the slow rocking movement of orbiting bodies. So from this bobbing motion, you can see the moon's spherical volume quite vividly, which would have not been observed from static images. Even though the effect is uh, aided by the shadow, we still can uh, perceive the moon's spherical shape from the bobbing motion only. Movement of living organism, which is collectively known as biological motion, provides us with unique information that can be distinguished from motions from inanimate objects. So I've started with Johansson's first experiment in 1973, uh, results with point line walkers shown in the, um, at the middle here. And so that is, so these are the, um, you know, how point line walkers are created and the results from these point line walkers, um, have shown we are remarkably sensitive to our own motion as if we have acquired knowledge of the motion. In fact, um, a lot more information can be extracted from a hand of, handful of dots moving together than we think. So this is a flash demonstration of biological motion from Nicholas Troyes Biomotion Lab in Canada. So from this demonstration, we can manipulate many features of Walker such as gender, overall physique, and even the emotional state of the walker. So here we have a standard walker, and if we move the gender slide to each extreme end to exaggerate the, uh, the male and female characteristic, then you will notice the, um, the obvious contrast uh, between the two, um, regardless how accurate um, they may be. So this is at the uh, male end, and if I move to <clears throat> the female end, and you can see that there's quite obvious difference between the two gender characteristics. And for the light female, so you can do this in multiple permutations. Um, so we have uh, four different variables to change, and you can just combine um, these variables to see how um, the point light walker um, changes its characteristics. So, someone is nervous. Mm. Happy. Happy. Julie. Sad basically you just become lethargic. So this is a very fun demonstration. So um, if you're interested in it, you can just play with all these variables yourself by going this website.
So when you're driving a car forward, you can sense the size of the road and above seems expanding towards you. So this pattern of movement is called optic flow. Now here the gradient of the flow is represented by different arrow length and the flow is more rapid near the moving observer and slower farther away. And there's a point on the horizon to which the observer is heading and out of which everything seems expanding with no flow is called the focus of expansion. So the idea of the optic flow started with the American scientist James Gibson around World War II and he believed that information provided by the optic flow is used by the observers for navigation purposes. So as the observer moves around the space, a characteristic perpetual pattern of motion generated by the observer's self-locomotion um, is called the optic flow. So it is this optic flow provides the information about a layout of objects in space. Then the gradient of flow will provide information about relative speed and direction of the observer and the distance of objects from the focus of expansion, which is kind of reference point in distance where there is no flow. Now, this drone cam, uh, drone cam clip shows an opposite pattern to the previous one where everything uh, is moving away from the viewer and um, sucked into a point in distance called the uh, focus of contraction. So, as we've just seen, optic flow is self-generated information. So when observer moves, uh, flow occurs by the movement of the observer and it's, it keeps flowing as long as she or he is in motion. Once the flow is created, then the objects around the observer move relative to the observer, provides more information for the next movement. The optic flow is a good cue to determine where we are in the environment. It differs from other cues because it is determined by our own actions. So motion perception can arise from various situations. First, we sense motion when the image of the object moves in the retina. So here, um, you know, we're fixating at the cross. So the eye is stationary and the object, the ball is moving from left to the right and the retinal image moves in the opposite direction. So when an object moves uh, on our retina, then that's the time we sense motion. And this is called an um, ocular centric motion. On the other hand, we also sense motion when we follow a moving object with smooth pursuit, which is a type of eye movement where I smoothly follow a moving target. This is called an egocentric or viewer-centered motion. And as we can see from the picture, the image of the, um, the ball will always fall on the same retinal location when uh, being pursued. But um, I just said before this, right, uh, motion perception arises from the retinal motion when an image of a visual object moves on the retina, didn't I? In smooth pursuit, uh, however, there's no retinal motion. Nevertheless, we never fail to see the ball moving. How about the situation where we create retinal motion over a static image? For example, we can move our eyes from A to B over the ball in the middle of um, in the middle of this uh, slide to create a retinal motion, right? But we know that the ball is not moving, and this leads to a more general question: how we distinguish if a motion across uh, across the retina is uh, generated by the eye movement or the actual moving object? 
So to resolve this problem, it was hypothesized that there is a sensory area of the visual system that receives a copy of the signal issued by the motor system from the eye muscles when the eyes move. So this copied signal is referred as corollary discharge signal. Now, after the eye movement, there is another signal coming from the retina called image movement signal telling if the uh, retinal image moved or not. The comparator um, in the end, so M received these uh, image movement signal and the, um, the correlated discharge signal um, and then compare them to compensate for retinal motion due to the eye movement by subtracting them. So let's take a look at um, the case by case um, based on this uh, corollary discharge theory. First, um, when you make a saccade from you know left to right uh, or right to left over a static image, so the according to the uh, theory, then when that happens, then the motor signal is created, right? Because uh, your eye moved, and then the copy of this motor signal is sent to this comparator, right? And then from the retina, um, the image movement signal is also created, right? Because um, by moving our eye over static image, uh, we uh, artificially created the um, retinal motion. So there's a signal from the retina that um, there was a motion in the retina and this is sent to the comparator too so the final output is comparing this uh, you know corollary discharge signal against image movement signal and if we subtract them they cancel each other out so there is no real motion Now, this time, I thought that there was a real movement uh, over fixation. So you didn't move your eye, but then outside there's something moved. So you didn't move your eye, so there's no motor signal and there's no copy of this signal sent to the comparator, right? But um, at the retinal level, there was actually a motion of that object. So the IMS is sent to the comparator, right? So the net signal is IMS. So there was a real motion detected. And finally, so when you follow an object, an object with a smooth pursuit, and the motor signal is generated from um, the eye moving, right? And then copy of this motor signal is sent to the comparator. But because uh, there was no retinal motion with smooth pursuit, so this is not sent to the comparator. So the nest signal is left with this copy, the corollary discharge signal. Right? So in this case, the real motion is also signaled. So that was a beautiful rendition of an apparent motion by Flipbook Animation, wasn't it? Unlike the motion perception caused by a real movement of an object, there are a number of instances where we sense motion even when nothing's really moving. We call this motion apparent motion, and this illusory impression of motion occurs when spatially separated, stationary stimuli presented sequentially on a connected path over a short time interval in a quick succession. So the um, apparent motion example shown here is called a beta or beta movement where the static spots are turned on and off 
in sequence with a frame rate of, of uh, you know, 10 to 12 frames per second, between which the pair motion typically arises. A motion picture or a moving billboard with um, LEDs are the real life examples of the apparent motion. As a general rule of thumb, we perceive the shortest path of motion for the apparent motion with flashes like this. So this is an illustration uh, of how apparent motion is different from the real motion when plotted on the space time diagram. So on the left, we have an apparent motion and real motion on the right. And the points are discrete in the apparent motion compared to the continuous real motion. Sometimes motion perception of a static image is caused by the relative movement of other objects. An example of this can be experienced by looking at the moon on a partly cloud windy night. When we watch the cloud passing by the moon long enough, uh, there's a time when you suddenly experience that it is the moon that is moving through the clouds, when in fact it's the other way around. So um, this relative movement, or sometimes called induced movement, is influenced by the frame of reference. Usually a larger object appears stationary and the smaller object appears to move when the opposite is reality. Uh, another real life example of the relative movement can be experienced when two trains going in the opposite directions are stopping side by side at the same time. Now your train is still uh, uh, stopping, still stopping, and the other train starts to move. Then you suddenly feel like you're moving backwards even though your train is still. Finally, uh, motion after effects also uh, make us see a static stimulus moving after prolonged exposure to a moving object. The effect always gives rise to motion in the opposite direction of the adapting motion. So here is an example of the uh, motion after effect called a waterfall illusion. So in this, um, I want you to fixate on the yellow cross in the middle of the fall. And please do not move your eyes for a minute. And at the end of the video, the movie will stop and see what happens to your perception of the waterfall. In computing the direction of motion, visual system sometimes faces a unique problem to solve known as an aperture problem. This occurs when a moving object is viewed through a smaller aperture than the entire size of the object, where the edges and terminals are hidden from a view. So here we have two slanted bars moving horizontally or vertically. So the actual movement of the left bar is actually um, horizontal, whereas the actual movement of this um, bar on the right is actually up and down, right? But when their motion is viewed through an aperture like this, then we see a movement perpendicular, a perpendicular to the, uh, the orientation of the bar in both cases which is the heuristics that the visual system applies to the aperture problem. 
you still probably see the actual movement but if i just you have you have to uh, look at the and uh, the movement inside the aperture right to see you know where it is actually moving but it's probably still difficult so i'll just to help you to cover um you know what's left and then if you look at um look inside the other uh, aperture then you can see that they are actually moving uh perpendicular to uh, the angle of the um the bars right so when a moving object is viewed through a smaller aperture than the entire size of the, ob the object and the direction of the motion of the local features or part of the object in the aperture uh, may become ambiguous so the visual system applies heuristics in this case assuming that the motion is perpendicular to the orientation of the edge or contour So a plate is a tartan-like pattern where two gratings with the differing orientations are overlaid on top of each other. Here, two gratings with different directions instead of orientations are superimposed and the resulting plate pattern appears to move in the direction of a vector sum direction of each individual grating, uh, which is just a component motion. When a moving plate grading pattern or random dots in motion is passed through the receptive field of direction selective V1 neurons, the neurons will respond to the individual component motion. However, our uh, final percept is of a coherent plate drifting in a vector sum of two component motions. So to see the global directions of uh, a direction of the uh, plate pattern motion, we need to leave V1 and head to extra strike area called MT where the direction signals coming from V1 are combined. So when a plate pattern arrives the receptive field of uh, the MT neurons, then the cell responds to the vector sum direction of the plate, which is the perceived direction of motion, not to the direction of each component gratings in MT are called pattern cells and the pattern cell can receive inputs from a series of component cells um, each of which has a different preferred direction from V1 then these different directional signals are combined in MT for the computation of the global direction of the plate So this division of labor in detecting local and global motion can be well illustrated in this striking starling murmuration. When we watch them flying around, we can see both the overall direction of motion and local motion from individual birds of which the global direction of motion is comprised as a group. So to test the uh, functional role of the MT and the relationship between the perception of local and global motion in mammals and humans, the stimulus called a random dot kinematogram uh, has been extensively used. And here are the, uh, some of the examples um, shown here. And this is probably one of the most popular stimuli to study motion in psychophysics and neuroscience experiments because it is very easy to manipulate the parameters of motion with which you can stimulate cells with the different directional selectivities. 
certainly our eye movements contribute to our motion perception. Our eyes continuously ex execute the rapid ballistic eye movement called saccades that continuously change fixation from one location to another every about 200 milliseconds. And it takes about three, uh, 30 to 100 milliseconds to complete. And this eye movement is so fast that even a real motion is often perceived only in snapshots. And the velocity ranges from 70 to 700 degrees per second. So between this, um, you know, saccadic eye movements, so the period is about 30 to 100 milliseconds, uh, it is literally blinding. And this is, uh, this phenomenon is called the saccadic suppression or masking. So this phenomenon is defined as a reduction in visual sensitivity that occurs during the saccadic eye movements. Um, this saccadic suppression is thought to eliminate trails or smear from the retinal image motion during an eye movement. In fact, you can test this saccadic suppression yourself with a mirror. So you look closely in a mirror and shift your gaze from one eye to the other. And you uh, will never be able to see your eyes moving back and forth. However, you will see the eye movement when you watch your friend or your family doing it. By the way, it is not going to work with your phone a phone camera due to a huge latency, so you need to have a mirror.